Okay, hello to webinar. Hello everyone, I think we'll now uh, start this uh, first webinar that we are doing about the microscopy. So thank you to everyone for attending this uh, webinar. We are quite numerous. Uh, we had to wait a couple of minutes and we have uh, uh, 10 more people that just connected. So uh, we'll start with this webinar about uh, using adaptive optics uh, in a single molecule localization microscopy. Uh, in particular, uh, optimizing the point spread function. So um, let's first uh, look at the outline of this presentation. Um, we will be two presenters uh, here today. So me, Fabrice Arms, uh, I'm a scientific coordinator at Imagine Optic. I will first uh, present you the context of uh, adaptive optics uh, as used in microscopy aberrations, uh, basics about adaptive optics and how it can be used for single molecule localization microscopy. And then Audrius Josaitis here, uh, who is uh, application specialist and sales manager for microscopy, will uh, dedicate a great part of this webinar to uh, hands-on and practical use of our uh, integrated adaptive optics uh, system for uh, single molecule localization microscopy, uh, where we'll demonstrate uh, PSF optimization, PSF shaping for 3D localization in, in, uh, in SML. And then we'll have uh, a few minutes for questions uh, at the end that you will be able to type uh, in, the, in, the, in the panel here. OK, so let's start now uh, the, this presentation with a, a couple of uh, uh, reminders, a couple of basics. Uh, first of all, uh, just very briefly, um, I will remind you about um, what Imagine Optic is currently uh, doing, in particular uh, in adaptive optics. So Imagine Optic is a company that's now for more than 20 years is uh, developing and manufacturing adaptive optics components and systems in various application fields. So we have four main application fields. First of all, optical metrology with the, mainly the use of wavefront sensors. Uh, a second uh, application field is high power lasers, uh, in particular with a line of uh, deformable mirrors, uh, large deformable mirrors uh, for, for this kind of uh, laser installations. We have also another application field, which is uh, X-ray and EUV that have very specific requirements. So uh, we have a specific line of products uh, for that. And then we have uh, also a line of product dedicated to life sciences and microscopy in particular, and we'll focus into that today. So basically our products in this line are uh, deformable mirrors, um, wavefront sensors, corresponding software for sure, but also some integrated adaptive optic systems dedicated to particular types of microscopes. And today we'll focus on Mikao 3DSR, which is our product dedicated to SMLM. Okay, so now let's go back to some very raw basics. Uh, probably some of you are, are already aware of all that, but I'll spend a couple of minutes on, on, the, on reminding the basis of AO and wavefront, etc. So first of all, uh, adaptive optics in microscopy. So as probably all you know, there are, let's say, three main reasons why microscopy image quality is uh, sometimes uh, very degraded. Uh, and these reasons are absorption, scattering, and also optical aberrations. So as soon as uh, your optical system, your optical microscope is not a perfect optical system, there are some optical aberrations that are here and that degrade uh, the image quality. But also as soon as you go in imperfect uh, samples, which is, let's say, nearly the case, uh, there are some optical aberrations, in particular in depths, and all these aberrations are responsible for both loss of signal, but also uh, responsible for loss of resolution. Uh, here on, in the presentation uh, on the bottom left, you can see some examples of uh, HeLa cells uh, embedded in a GAR. And as soon as you go in depth, you see a combination of absorption, scattering, and optical aberration that strongly degrades the image uh, quality. And now for, uh, let's say, more than 10 years, it has been uh, demonstrated that adaptive optics can uh, definitely correct aberrations. So only the, this part of, of the, the, 
degradation uh, origins uh, and in strongly improve the, the fluorescent signal. And it has been demonstrated in various uh, microscopy modalities, including two photon, confocal, light sheets, and, and single molecule localization microscopy. And, and we'll focus today on, on this part, the single molecule localization microscopy. Okay, so now within one minute, just some basics about the wavefront for those who are not uh, fully aware about that. So the, the wavefront, uh, as defined is in a geometric approach, is uh, the surface that's orthogonal to all rays. So when you consider a perfect point source, either it's collimated or diverging, the wavefront is either flat or purely spherical. But as soon as uh, the point source is, for example, crossing some imperfect uh, medium, then the wavefront is aberrated and, and strongly distorted as represented here. And when now considering the focusing po point that comes from this wavefront, uh, the point spread function, so the PSF, is degraded in the presence of aberrations, so the shape of the PSF is strongly uh, disturbed. And here are a couple of uh, the main aberrations that are uh, present in uh, optical uh, systems. Here, this is the third order. We have, for example, astigmatism here. And the point spread function is here uh, when looking at through Z, coming from a line to, uh, to an enlarged uh, focus and to another line orientated 90, at 90 degrees. For coma, we have a PSF, a point spread function that has uh, the shape of a comet here. And for spherical aberration, which is very important in microscopy, here the point spread function uh, around the focalization pot is very uh, quickly uh, enlarged by, uh, by spherical aberration. So the general idea is that this aberration mathematically can be described as a set of polynomials that are usually Zernike polynomials uh, as defined on a circle of pupil, as described here. And the main Zernike components that you can see in microscope and in general in most of the uh, optical system of third order, so trefoil, coma, spherical aberration, astigmatism here, and we'll focus uh, into this aberration later on during the hands on Okay, so here a quick link to single molecule localization microscopy and palm storm in particular, uh, because this is what we will focus on during the hands on. Uh, this is linked between the PSF and, and, and palm storm. So, as you all know, uh, just very raw basics uh, a palm storm is based on, on wide field excitation of the sample, and each fluorophore randomly em emits some photons. And these photons are gathered by the optical microscope and form a point spread function at the level of the camera. And the point spread function here is very critical in terms of the quality of the image uh, because uh, Palmstorm is based on localizing this PSF and, and, and using fitting, being able to very accurately determine the position of the center of this PSF. And this is also true in 3D localization because usually, usually 3D localization makes use of a particular PSF shape and as soon as this particular PSF shape is not exactly what it is expected to be, then 3D localization also is also degraded in the presence of aberrations. So the, the main message is that controlling the PSF is really a critical driver of your uh, imaging performance in terms of the number of counts per PSF, the number of photons inside, the shape of the PSF when considering localization. And we'll come back into that during the hands-on for sure. Okay, so now in adaptive optics, there are three components. In adaptive optics, you need to measure the wavefront, shape the wavefront, and use some kind of a software to control all that. So when we want to measure the wavefront, usually a wavefront sensor is used, and the most uh, used type of wavefront sensor is uh, Shackartman. Here, this is a very brief reminder. Uh, Shackartman is based on using a microlens array in front of a camera. When the wavefront is perfect, 
each uh, microlens array focuses on the camera and creates a spot here localized on a, on a grid uh, of uh, pixels. And as soon as uh, the wavefront is aberrated, uh, these spots are deviated uh, regarding a, a regular grid. And the measurement of these deviations of each spot uh, gives rise to a measurement of the derivative of the wavefront and then, so the local slopes, and then there's an integration process to be able to recommend the wavefront itself. Okay, so now, when considering the correction and the shaping of the wavefront, uh, a phase modulator is used. So there are various types of wavefront modulators that can be based on uh, liquid crystals such as uh, SLMs, also segmented uh, deformable, uh, very small uh, mirrors, and continuous membrane deformable mirrors. Each of these uh, modulators have a particular uh, their uh, own uh, advantages and, and limitations. I will uh, here mostly focus on microscopy, where it's uh, usually considered that continuous membrane deformable mirror are, are the best choice because they are quite large uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of the wavelengths that are accepted. They are usually quite achromatic due to uh, very uh, broad, uh, very broad uh, uh, optical coatings at the surface of the membrane. Usually you can achieve very high stroke, which is uh, usually required in microscopy in terms of focus or spherical aberration. Um, and uh, and uh, usually the speed is enough, even if it's a limitation for some other applications of the AO, for example, in astronomy here, in microscopy, usually time is not uh, such a big deal. Also, usually this kind of mirrors have uh, not that many actuators when compared to SLM, for example, but in microscopy, it's usually not a limitation because most of the aberrations that are present in optical microscope are quite low order and the number of actuators on this kind of mirrors is usually enough. So we'll focus on, on this one. It's the, the kind of deformable mirror that's present in our system. Okay, so now let's focus on how to drive all these components. There are usually two main uh, algorithms to drive uh, both the measurement and the correction. Uh, historically, the first one was closed loop optimization. It's uh, the, 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 the scheme that has been developed for correcting for uh, atmospheric turbulence. Here it's based on the direct wavefront measurement from a wavefront sensor uh, that's uh, measured. It's sent to a computer that calculates what is the corresponding correction that's sent directly to a phase modulator and all this is running in a feedback loop. So there has been a, a lot of uh, demonstration of all that in various application fields. Um, the positive thing here is that it's quite fast to be able to converge to the right correction. The accuracy of the measurement is very good because it's, it's, it's based on a direct wavefront measurement from sensors. But uh, the main limitation here for some application is that to do that, you need to have a guide star, which means a, a point source that emits a perfect wavefront. Okay, so now let's go back, let's go to the second uh, way to control uh, adaptive optics, which is image based uh, algorithms. Here, it's particularly interesting in, uh, in the case where you don't have any guide star, which is usually the case in microscopy because you don't necessarily want to embed a particular fluorescent bead, for example. Uh, it's it's uh, usually not possible to do that or, or not uh, something you want in terms of biology. Here, the idea is to use directly the image that's uh, acquired by uh, the camera of your microscope, for example. And on this image, you define a merit factor. So uh, an image quality uh, metric, let's say. So for each of the image of the camera, the merit factor is evaluated. And here, the wavefront is sequentially modulated for, for example, for each Zernike coefficient, the wavefront is modulated in a predefined uh, manner, and there's an evaluation of this change of the wavefront on the merit factor. 
in order to determine what's the best shape in terms of a particular learning key to achieve the best merit factor. And all that is repeated for various zonic polynomials. And at the end, you have a set of optimal zonic polynomials to be able to correct for the aberrations. Because this is uh, a scheme that's working quite well when, when you don't have any guide star. Uh, another advantage is that even if you have some uh, level of scattering, it's still able to, to, to work uh, and to define a, a merit factor on the image. And the main drawback of that is that it requires some, uh, some uh, significant amount of time as compared to direct reference sensing, which can be responsible to some uh, bleaching of the, of the sample. So it's usually not something that you want to use for any imaging in microscopy, for example. There's quite a lot of uh, literature about that, uh, of various uh, algorithm merit factor that has been defined in the past. Okay, so how does this work, this uh, image-based algorithms? Because uh, we'll focus here on that because this is what we use in our uh, adaptive optic system for SMLM. So concretely, as, uh, as we said, uh, we use here a, th a three N type of algorithm where the merit factor here is defined as the maximum intensity of the image. And for each Wernicke mode, three images are acquired with uh, a different uh, aberration level. Okay. For example, let's consider, uh, let's say, one aberration, spherical aberration, for example. The first measurement of, of the image quality, which is here, for example, one single bead is, uh, is acquired. Then a predefined amount of aberration, which is probably here uh, astigmatism, is applied on the mirror. The merit factor is the inverse uh, amount here, for example, of astigmatism is applied, and also the merit factor is evaluated on the image. And at the end, it has been demonstrated that the evolution of the merit factor with various levels of aberration is following a quadratic curve. So based on this three measurement, it's possible to fit to a parabola and to de determine the optimal value that's able to come to the best merit factors, the best image quality. So all this is repeated for certain number of uh, Zernike modes. Typically in microscopy, third order are uh, good enough to uh, very uh, strongly improve image quality. Uh, so this is definitely an iterative sequential algorithm as uh, described before. And typically roughly about 40 images are uh, necessary to achieve a good correction. But we'll demonstrate that during the hands-on uh, just afterwards. So okay, now um, let's focus on our particular system dedicated to SMLM. This is a Mikao 3DSR, which is quite a plug-and-play system. Here everything is embedded in, in this uh, blue box. Um, and the roughly, the, the, well, briefly, the main feature is that it's compatible to various uh, objective types and various uh, cameras. Um, it can be optionally, uh, it can integrate uh, away from the imager. It's very stable, so stability of the deformable has been, uh, has been uh, increased because usually these kind of deformable mirrors can show over a long period of time uh, very strong dependence to temperature. And it can be implemented on both sides of the microscope. So the general method is that this system has been really uh, optimized for SMLM and power storm systems. Uh, so just some illustration of what I said before. The idea is that with this system, it's possible to perfect the PSF. So correct for most common aberration that you can find in your microscope coming from this type of PSF that's degraded due to the presence of aberration to an optimized one. Uh, and you can definitely see here that uh, there's a, a great effect in terms of signal to noise ratio because all the photons are gathered and, and, and put back in the right place, let's say, at the, at the, really at the focusing point. So there's an effect in signal to noise. Um, when considering 3D localization using PSF shaping, for example, here using astigmatic uh, PSF, the idea is that by correcting aberration, you can go back to a pure astigmatism uh, that's not degraded by uh, residual aberrations. And for sure, then 
the uh, localization precision is uh, strongly increased because the calibration curve is uh, coming back to a linear function, uh, which is not the case with the residual aberration, as you'll see during, for example, during the handle. And as a result, um, because uh, SMLM is usually, usually based on localization algorithms, um, uh, when in the presence of optical aberration, usually these algorithms are rejecting uh, false PSFs or degraded PSF. Here, by correcting uh, for aberrations, the PSF are strongly, uh, strongly improved and an algorithm will reject less uh, counts. So you increase definitely the number of counts. Um, in terms of 3D localization, you restore the axial symmetry. There's more photons per PSF. And as a result, as you can see here on this image, the number of counts is strongly increased. OK. Just a, uh, a brief uh, focus on, uh, on the 3D localization using, for example, astigmatic PSF. Here, this is just an example with a 200 nanometer fluorescent bead at about 30 micron in depth. And before correction, you can see with this uh, XZ and YZ uh, PSFs that the asymmetry of the astigmatic PSF here is lost over a wide range, which means that in this range, it will not be possible to say if uh, the fluorescent emitter is localized here or here. As a consequence, the calibration curves are strongly distorted. Okay. Now, if we correct aberration, this symmetry of the PSF is restored. You can see uh, here. And as a result, calibration curves are corrected and localization precision will be strongly uh, increased. OK, here, uh, another example of uh, the advantage of using adaptive optics in this kind of system is that it's quite versatile, which means that since you have since you make use of a variable uh, wavefront uh, modulator, it's possible to induce various PSF shapes. So the most used one is astigmatic, uh, in order to mimic uh, astigmatic lens that's usually used in this kind of 3D uh, SMLM systems. But it's also possible to induce other types of PSFs, uh, such as the tetrapod PSF, which is uh, some kind of PSF that um, that increases the, the range of localization precision. And here, this is just an example of an acquisition we, we just made before the, uh, the webinar to, 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 to show the, 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 well, how, how uh, such a tetrapod PSF looks like. That we'll, we'll demonstrate that uh, just afterwards. OK, so I think I'm done for this uh, first slideshow. It, 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 uh, it explained the, the basics of AO, the basis of how it can be applied to SMLM. So now I think I will uh, let Audrius speak and, and show you, um, um, show you uh, the hands-on. So let's, let's, uh, he, will, uh, he will take the lead now. And uh, after the hands on, uh, you will be able to, uh, to ask questions. Uh, there's a particular questions uh, area here in, in your panel. So I, uh, I will take the lead on, on that after the hands on uh, part. But you're, you can already type your questions right now, and, and I'll come back to this question after the hands out part. So don't hesitate to type your questions uh, in the dedicated area. And, I will go through them afterwards after the, the hands up. Okay. So now Audrey's will. Okay, now I think <laughs> you're able to to see the microscope uh, screen. Uh, hello everybody. Uh, to the hands on part of the webinar. Okay. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much for this uh, for this introduction and uh, well, uh, in this part of the, of the webinar, I will be showing you uh, showing how your PDSR works, uh, how to how can we using Nikel PDSR, how, how can we correct vibrations on the surface of the cover slip, uh, how we can uh, modify the PSF or 
for using this. We use it for a schematic imaging for the power storm microscopy. Uh, as well, uh, we'll look a little bit into Professor Kotke's set. Uh, and then with the end of this, uh, we will try to go deeper into the sample and uh, to correct uh, sample induced aberrations and, uh, and uh, as well be stored uh, schematic data. Uh, so, some words about uh, <coughs> about the DSR. Uh, obviously, we presented this uh, in details, but uh, uh, here you can see it's uh, connected to the uh, inverted frame from Leica. Uh, this uh, frame has been kindly provided by Leica France, so we appreciate uh, the help. Uh, and uh, so, the device can be uh, attached to any inverted frame microscope, and uh, it basically uh, acts as an image relay between uh, the image plane at the axis of the microscope and uh, brings the image back uh, at the exit of the And on the way uh, uh, inside the decal, it uh, basically we organized one more uh, back focal plane <coughs> and where we put the deformable mirror. Uh, in order to act on the face, the deformable mirror has to be in the back. Uh, uh, it's a continuous membrane deformable mirror. It uh, has 52 actuators, and basically, it's a deformable mirror which is ideal for uh, applications in microscopy. Uh, it's also very stable in time, so, so the, it allows uh, very long term uh, positions, uh, which are now quite uh, frequently uh, required in, uh, in power store um, So, the system is capable to correct. Uh, so called system aberrations, uh, so aberrations induced by the objective lens, uh, by other optical elements uh, inside the microscope. And this way uh, already improve, uh, improve the photon count and the focal spot. Uh, but as well, uh, we can also correct uh, sample induced aberrations. And, and this way really increase the, the number of photons and uh, sometimes even restore, uh, restore the Capability of, to, of imaging. For example, when you when you try to image deep in the sample uh, due to spherical aberration, uh, uh, stigmatic PSF is totally ruined, and uh, without correction, specifically correction of that uh, spherical aberration, uh, the stigmatic approach is not usable deeper in the sample. I would say starting from 10 micrometers, you cannot use uh, 3D imaging anymore. So, this is I will, I will try to show you during the demo. Um, the device is typically installed and we, uh, we fix it to the table uh, for, uh, as the first, uh, as the first uh, calibration, let's say we use the Schacharkman wavefront sensor, which we replaced, uh, replaced the imaging camera and we attach Schacharkman wavefront sensor, and we do the calibration of the, of the uh, formable mirror using uh, point source on the, on the sample level. Um, the, uh, and then after calibration, we do the first uh, approximation, the, the closed loop optimization, as Fabrice uh, described uh, a couple of minutes ago. So, this gives a first starting point uh, for uh, correcting calibrations. Uh, and on that, we replaced the uh, uh, wavefront imager with the camera, and, uh, and the further optimization of the point spread function we make uh, using. Uh, Image based algorithms uh, uh, like 3N and uh, using the maximum density as a maximum. Okay, so uh, I guess I will start sharing my screen then and uh, we'll, we'll show how the points per function looks like. I hope you will be able to see my screen. Uh, okay, so for, for this. Uh, this webinar, I'm using uh, Micromanager uh, as uh, to, to apply images. So, uh, and uh, on, on the sample, uh, the sample I'm, I'm having uh, fluorescent bead, so it's a uh, 200 nanometer diffraction limited. Bead. So, what, what we see, we really see the points per function of the uh, microscope. Uh, and uh, at first, I will uh, show you how. Uh, that well optimized PSF looks like. Uh, so, this is what I did optimization not long ago. So, if you go in and out of focus, you, you can see 
Here you can see the uh, intensity. So we have about 20,000 counts in focus. And when, when we go out of the focus, the intensity goes, diminishes very quickly. And uh, we see such a feature less, let's say, uh, TSF on both sides of the focus, so in quite similar way. But, uh, but the key point is that the, the, the intensity goes down very quickly. Here we have auto scaling, so, so that's why you can see uh, pretty well this noise, but it's uh, really like featureless, uh, featureless noise. Uh, as a demonstration, how aberration looked like, uh, Fabrice showed a little bit uh, during the slideshow. Uh, but uh, here we're using our Mikael software, so this is the software dedicated for uh, controlling the device and uh, uh, to induce aberrations. Uh, and to do optimization using 3M. Uh, so here is the panel which is dedicated for uh, so let's say open loop uh, to add aberrations or to remove uh, aberrations manually. Uh, for example, I will add a little bit of astigmatism so you can see how astigmatism looks like. Uh, if we slowly defocus, you can see that the PSF extends in one and the other direction. Uh, some format. So you see that the point spec function becomes uh, if maximum intensity goes on, on one side along the focus, if you go in and out of focus. Um, probably the most common aberration is uh, spherical aberration, which uh, as a feature of non, like a really a bright dot on one side of the focus and the uh, concentric rings on the other side of the focus. So this is what we see uh, typically when we go into, in, into the sample, deeper into the sample. Okay. Um, so this is just a demonstration of uh, what the type of vibrations we typically see and then that there are also higher orders of these aberrations, which we sometimes have to correct uh, in the cost. Uh, so the next step is to, to optimize uh, to optimize the point spread function, and uh, for that I need to restart my software into remote mode. Just a moment. Uh, because uh, for image-based algorithms, uh, for them to work, we need uh, to take images of the sample in this case images. And uh, we need to establish the exchange of images between uh, the two software, the image acquisition software and, uh, and the adaptive optics software. Uh, as an example, I be, let's say, preloaded aberrations into the shape. Okay, our, our software allows uh, to save any, any, any shape of the mirror. So if you optimize your PSF, you can uh, save the shape of the mirror and load it later. Uh, so similar, similarly, uh, just before the starting the webinar, I uh, added some aberrations to the point spread function, to optimize point spread function, and uh, called it the uh, bad PSF. So we, uh, we can take a look. Basically, I added some astigmatism, some comma, some spherical aberration, and you can see that it's, uh, it's definitely not ideal. There's a lot of comma. There are means spherical aberration. Um, so now we will try to optimize this and to, to, to get uh, to get the uh, ideal PSF again. So the the most important parameter here is this value, which is uh, shows when when you put the image in focus, it shows the maximum intensity in the probe. So this is the, the parameter which we use for the optimization. And for for basically converging our three of algorithm, uh, so I choose the optimization mode, uh, which is already here, and uh, put old image two. Uh, I choose astigmatism, comma, spherical, and maybe trifoil. And uh, here are the search limits in, in which uh, the algorithm will vary uh, optimization, basically. Uh, those are in nanometer RMS units, so it will uh, add and remove uh, each of these aberrations uh, with the sample. So I 
clip starts and you will start to see uh, the constant function changing. Uh, this is astigmatism. And uh, we following this, uh, this, this value. So uh, the starting value was 19,000. And uh, during uh, optimization, so, so now the algorithm goes through all these nodes and we are basically correcting uh, each of them sequentially. And then you can see how the value increases. <clears throat> okay, so we started with, with 19 and now it's 25. We <clears throat> accept the uh, optimization because it's improved. And we can take a look at the point spread function. How does that look now? So it's already much more symmetrical. Um, and, uh, yeah, almost all the features are gone. Uh, so the algorithm is sequential, so that means, uh, which means that uh, it has to be repeated in order to, uh, in order to, uh, to be sure that uh, optimization is complete. So what we typically do, uh, we optimize uh, one more time in order to see that uh, the value does not increase anymore. The, the easiest way, uh, probably, uh, during everyday uh, work uh, is to select all the nodes and then to run through all of them in order to be sure that uh, all the nodes are corrected and uh, taken care of. <clears throat> uh, the speed here, I, I slowed down a little bit uh, in order to, to see it better. Uh, the, the algorithm can run faster. Uh, it, it really depends on the acquisition time and uh, exposure time of the camera. Uh, I will also try to optimize higher orders. So, um, there are modes of the fifth order, fifth order of two astigmatisms again, two commas, spherical operation, and tether foil. It's always a good idea to, to, to run all these, all those modes, just to make sure that everything is correct. <coughs> So we saw that the improvement is not big, not very much anymore, but still there is time. So yeah, we started with 24 and now it's almost 26 game. We step this. We take a look again at the point spread function. And the, the intensity goes down just immediately. This is uh, it's really if you have very sharp focus and all other operations are, are gone. So it's probably a good time to save the points per function. Uh, <clears throat> it can be done at any point. Uh, and uh, always some intermediate optimization. So the next next aspect of uh, Mikao, the second thing that, that Mikao does. This was the first one to optimize and to get as many problems as you can in the, in the focus, let's say, so which, which directly corresponds to the localization precision in your typical imaging routine. Uh, second thing is uh, you, you can, uh, as you can see, the point spread function is symmetrical along the z axis. So you, you don't know on which side you are uh, if you go on one or the other side of the focus. Uh, but uh, so basically, we need to break this axial symmetry in order to do 3D, and uh, this can be done using uh, astigmatism. Uh, here, I have in, in my plugin uh, pre-configured uh, button to start astigmatism, let's say, uh, and uh, this will add uh, 100 nanometers of astigmatism automatically. And uh, basically, now you see that the point spread function is not uh, the same, not the same. Well, the axis. Uh, it extends in one direction and the other direction, and the amplitude of extension depends on how far from, from the focus you are. Uh, so as you can see, a good deformable mirror it induced astigmatism extends way, way more than uh, using cylindrical lens. And, uh, and this actually amplitude you can uh, define yourself. You can, you can choose, uh, you can add more, you can add less. Uh, and which determines your cell resolution. And, 
and it is also very symmetrical axially. Uh, it, it is the same on both sides of the focus. It extends to the same extends to the same extent <laughs> on both sides of the focus. Um, we uh, basically for the, the next uh, the important factor in the 3D imaging is the calibration curve, uh, which is typically determined by from the Z tag taken of the Let's say yes, I only did uh, since this uh, taking this tag takes uh, quite some time. I don't want to waste time. I already uh, took the stack uh, through semantic directions, and uh, we will try to do the calibration curve. This is the uh, same function. It's probably 60 nanometers. That's why. 60 nanometers are mass of astigmatism, it's a little bit less than I was showing you here. Uh, so it is extending slightly less. But this is what we find <clears throat> optimal value for uh, basically, uh, it's a good compromise between the uh, available Z and uh, and how much uh, and the resolution you can get. Uh, so to do the calibration, well, I can actually first uh, show you the axial profile. Um, using orthogonal views, um, as you can see that uh, it really extends very well along the axis. If you look on the other side, it similarly extends to similar extent. And uh, okay, so let's try to do the calibration work. I'm using uh, thunderstorm for for. Taking calibration work uh, and uh, basically with uh, some uh, values. So now it's fitting this uh, Z stack, and you can see the calibration curve, which is quite symmetrical. Along the axis, and we have roughly from minus 400 to 400 nanometers uh, available Z value. <coughs> uh, okay. uh, the, the next, uh, uh, another way how to do Z, uh, see, the, uh, how to address the uh, Great axial symmetry and to uh, get the Z information is uh, to use the tetrapod PSF. Uh, the advantage of tetrapod PSF is that you can uh, do much more uh, higher Z range. So, tetrapod PSF is also a, a mixture, let's say, combination of different types of astigmatisms. And I also preloaded uh, already uh, tetrapod PSF to my beam shaper, let's say. And uh, here, here it is. Uh, wide. We can basically we, we have uh, wider PSF in the focus. Uh, the maximum intensity is also much lower on this. But in this case, if you will think about this, we have something like twenty thousand counts. Here we have uh, about six thousand counts, so relatively. And uh, the point spread function then uh, behaves quite different. It, it splits into two dots and then uh, three dots and four dots and uh, uh, goes on. But uh, the, the key here is that you still have a signal when you go deeper. Uh, so typically, uh, this point spread function allows to go to three to five micrometer, micrometers. Uh, and of course, it's a, it's a compromise between how how deep you want to go and how many photons you have in each localization. Uh, with the fluorescent bead, it's very easy. You have a lot of photons, so we can show you very nicely. But when you go to <coughs> real uh, single molecule localizations, uh, the, the, it becomes a critical point uh, how many photons do you have. So uh, there should be a compromise basically between how how what, what amplitude of tetrapod you can use and uh, how deep you can go. Uh, I also pre-recorded this tetrapod PSF. Uh, we can work in sequence. Um, oh, we didn't pre-record. 
Yeah, I didn't read it, but we can take a step back very quickly. I'm going to stop my this uh, We can take a step back using the form of order. And uh, since the uh, focus is one of observed uh, remotes, so we can uh, use the form of order in order to, uh, to use that stack. And uh, so, okay, so I have preloaded the jump like this out, make sure that it's in the focus. And take this Yes, the advantage of Tetrapod BSF is that it gives you much higher Z range, but this is also quite critical in terms of, uh, becomes quite critical in terms of operations because if your Z range is very different and you are in conditions where you imaging with oil objective uh, the water based sample, you will start, definitely start to see differences between uh, uh, different sides of the focus. Uh, there will be Uh, there would be quite uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the PSF would not be symmetrical along the dead axis. Okay, uh, but if you do correct in the center, then this would minimize this effect uh, significantly. So basically, again, using adaptive optics, uh, this would be quite a valuable tool. Uh, this the Z stack is almost done, so I will grow this. Now we can see the how symmetrical is the PSF. Uh, after this webinar, I will try to organize some uh, of the data sharing uh, presentations, so, which I will send to you with all these examples, so you could uh, analyze yourself and then take a deeper look. Um, okay, uh, we still have time for going deeper with the sample. Uh, do we have any questions? So, yeah, I, I'm answering the question online. I will try to, uh, the next step is to try to go deeper into the sample. Uh, therefore, I'll, I'll go look for the beat, uh, which will take a normal beat. So now we have the shape of the optimized PSF on the surface, and we are roughly at 23 micrometers inside the sample. Uh, so there is already, and, and the sample is water based, uh, so there is already a significant amount of uh, aberration in there, sorry, aberration. So if we look, we look at this uh, PSF, you, you, you simply stop, stop seeing uh, things due to spherical aberration, especially on, on this side, it's, it's totally, totally ruined by spherical aberration. Uh, so if I remove now, move out the 3M shape, and you can see, so this is the PSF without any, any additional aberrations. So you see that there are there's a lot of spherical aberration shown by these rings. So I will try to correct uh, specifically for this spherical aberration uh, by optimization mode. Uh, open spherical aberration. Make a couple of uh, iterations. So here we start already this, uh, the beam is a uh, way that is much less signal from the beam. Um, because we are deeper in the sample, so there is scattering and uh, mostly scattering. 
and aberration. So the, the aberrational part we, we are trying to correct. So we start with 5,000 counts, we are closer to time. This shows up as well. Let's take a look at the skill set. It's already much less strings uh, responding to very collaboration. And we have closer to 10,000 counts. I will run maybe one more time for the circle. So we can uh, now probably save this question function, save the shape as a three and uh, and uh, I will use astigmatism. Just induce astigmatism. Uh, We need to restart the interface. Ah, Sorry. <laughs> so I will quickly restart the software. I'm sorry for that. And I will try to do manual addition of astigmatism. It's good that we should save the shape of the mirror. Okay, so it's the speed, three points, make a crop on it. Okay, so this. Software automatically loaded already the, the last uh, required shape of the mirror, which is uh, optimized at, at this depth. Uh, and I will uh, manually add a stigmatism to this. Okay, so it extends quite symmetrically on both sides. And uh, just for comparison, I will load then the shape from the surface so you will see the difference how much uh, how much we corrected uh, due to the same collaboration, let's say. If I add um, stigmatism again. So you see that it extends a little bit on one side. And then it's ruined on the other side by spherical operation. It splits, uh, the point square function splits into two dots, and basically it's not possible to fit the outside of the point. Just complete, and we'll load the corrected shape. <coughs> and we'll add the stigmatism. And 
nicely extends to both directions. Yes. Okay, so this is all I wanted to show on the, on the hands on session. And uh, we now probably will do the questions and uh, answers part. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed um, this uh, live uh, demo. Uh, so there were a couple of questions uh, I tried to answer. Uh, the first one, the, the, there is one that I would like others to answer. The question was about the refractive index mismatching in this particular demonstration, and also um, what, it, what was the mounting medium here and buffer? Yeah, okay. So uh, basically, uh, the sample is with um, those are beads, beads are embedded in the eyebrows. So you can, <coughs> it's basically a water based sample. <coughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <coughs> yeah, let's start the camera. Um, so those are beads embedded in eyebrows, so which, which is basically a water-based sample. So refractive index mismatch was uh, 1.33 uh, water, and then uh, uh, 1.52 uh, oil immersion objective. So quite significant refractive index mismatch. But this is a typical situation in palm storm imaging. Uh, this is like real, real things. And uh, basically, the, those were beads, uh, fluorescent beads. In water, the, 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 there was no buffer. Okay, so I hope it uh, it answers this uh, particular question. So, if you have uh, other ones, uh, we have probably one to two minutes uh, uh, to to answer that. Uh, I would like to add a word and to particularly uh, thank uh, Leica Microsystems uh, who provided uh, nicely uh, this uh, very good microscope for this particular webinar. So. Really, uh, thank you to to Leica and Leica France uh, in particular. Um, okay, so um, yeah, just uh, just uh, talking, waiting for uh, maybe some other questions. But if there are no other ones, just I will uh, I would like to remind that there will be in a couple of weeks, I think, another webinar that will be uh, dedicated to a particular use that has been made. Uh, of, of this system by uh, by the, the the lab of Lucas Capitain in Utrecht, who will uh, who accepted to present his uh, very nice uh, results that he recently published. Yeah, amazing results. We're yeah. Going deeper imaging at 50 up to 80 micrometer depth. Yes, and and correcting aberration and increasing number of counts by a typically factor of 10, as, yeah. as, as far as I remember. Um, so yeah, again, I, I I see that there are no particular other questions so if you have any uh, other questions don't hesitate uh, to contact us in particular to contact Audrius if you want to 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 get uh, for example uh, some extra material about uh, this and this presentation and all products do not hesitate hesitate to contact us uh, by email um, we would like to thank you again very much for attending the the presentation I think it's now time it's uh, it's uh, one hour oh okay there's uh, another question uh, how do you calibrate the the DEM uh, so good question so uh, typically we use a wavefront sensor to do uh, to do the interaction matrix uh, for this system uh, during installation in particular so as soon as the setup as the, the Mikao system is installed on the microscope there's a calibration that's based on the Shakatman wavefront sensor and as soon as this uh, calibration is done, you don't need any more uh, to, to, to perform uh, calibration every day, for example, as soon as the system is not moved uh, or as soon as there is no change in the optical setup, right? If the system is dismounted and mounted again and realigned, then an extra calibration has to be made again using the, the wavefront sensor. Uh, so I hope this uh, answer, yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Can it be optimized on the fly? Single molecule data. So this is the yeah, that's a very good question. And I think this is typically what Lucas Capitain is doing. So uh, there's a recent paper in I don't remember the journal where it published. Uh, I think it's uh, biomedical optics biomedical express. Biomedical yeah. express. 
So typically, uh, it can be done using uh, some particular uh, merit function based on the image. And I think on the work he, he did, he used um, merit function based on the Fourier transform on the image. And, and this can be done on the fly. Well, it takes some uh, amount of time to optimize because it's also iterative uh, algorithm and sequential calculation. But, but this can be uh, typically done on the image itself, yes. And this is what uh, Lucas will pre present uh, in the next. In the next webinar, yeah. So don't hesitate to to follow this uh, next webinar for sure. Okay, so uh, I think we are done. Uh, maybe some of you have uh, other constraints. Uh, so thank you again. Yeah. I would yeah, say thanks. thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, don't hesitate to contact us. And uh, see, you see you next time. <laughs> yeah, you will probably receive an email. Uh, see you next time at another webinar, at, I hope, at a conference <laughs> when we'll be allowed to go to a conference. Don't hesitate to go uh, pass uh, to our booths. OK. Thank you all. and. Uh, See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.